started and we are expecting more students and I'm sure they'll be um, coming in uh, around the back way. Uh, I want to say thank you all for coming. My name is Salima Elamine. I currently serve as a research associate in the newly named Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity um, up under Dr. W William Darity, who was away this year at the Russell Sage Foundation. So I bring you greetings from him and also from the director of Geary, uh, Jay Pearson, who is also away this year. And we thank you. This is our first Tuesday tea event for the semester. And we're just so honored um, to have two very, very distinguished guests. Um, and I have up just, we have a, a new name and a new website and just some information. Uh, we had a naming ceremony. Um, this is that's Dr. Cook um, and the president of the university and his family and wives. And so we're just so excited. And the Global Inequality Research Initiative actually falls up under the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity. Uh, this semester, we are teaching a class, uh, myself, Laura Smart Richmond and Nina Smith on race, class and psychology. In the spring, we'll be teaching a class on the social determinants of health um, next next year on inequality, in, energy and inequality. And so it's been global blackness has also been a topic. So it's very broad. It, it fo focuses on all different types of types of global inequality. And so I won't take up much of your time, but we have two very, very distinguished guests with us. And we're honored to have you all kick off our Tuesday Tea series for the 2015-2016 school year. So I'll introduce both and then they'll just come up right behind each other. Um, but the first is the Dean of the School of uh, Sanford, um, um, Dean Kelly Brunel, and he is the Dean, obviously, of the Sanford School of Public Policy here at Duke University. Uh, he's a professor of public policy. He also serves on the board of directors of the Duke Global Health Institutes. Um, Dr. Brunel has advised the White House, members of Congress, governors, world and um, nutrition organizations, and also media leaders on issues of nutrition, obesity, and public policy. In 2006, he was actually named one of Time Magazine's most influential people um, and whose power, talent, and more example is transforming the, web, the world. And his research deals primarily with obesity in the intersection of behavior, environment, and health, along with public policy. And so during his career, he's also served as a president of several national organizations, including the Society of Behavioral Medicine and the Association for the Advancement of Behavior Therapy. Therapy. Um, he has numerous awards, obviously lifetime achievement awards. He's published more than 15 books and 350 um, scientific articles and chapters. And as a junior faculty member, that's just amazing and something I look look forward to one day, if even getting anywhere close to that. And prior to joining joining Duke University, he was at Yale University as the James Roland Andrew Professor of Psychology, Epidemiology, Public Health, and the director of the Rudd Center for. Um, public food, food policy and obesity. And so he will be our first speaker and followed by that, we will have Dr. Nadine Barrett, who directs the Office of Health Equity at the Duke Cancer Institute. Um, Dr. Barrett is the recipient of several awards and honors, including the American Sociological Association's Minority Fellowship Doctoral Award and the NIH Postdoctoral Fellowship in Health Services Research at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her areas of special specialization include health disparities, cultural competence, community and health outreach, community organi organi organizing and engagement among diverse populations, and research methodologies with particular emphasis on community-based participatory research. Um, and prior to joining, joining Duke University, Dr. Barrett was with the Susan, Susan G. Coleman Cure Global Headquarters global headquarters, where she was successful in a collaborative efforts to serve organizations and communities by identifying community health needs and disseminating evidence-based programming to enhance breast cancer screening, treatment, and survivorship. And as the founding director of the Duke Cancer Institute Office of Health Equity and Disparities, she uses her expertise across three specific areas, community engagement, outreach, screening programs, and patient navigation across the continuum of care. So please join me and welcome our two speakers. We have Dr. Burnell first, followed by Dr. Barry, and thank you so much for joining us today. So would it be possible to get my slides up there? Thanks. I'm really looking forward to hearing Dr. Barrett's talk, by the way, and it's a good pleasure for me to, to be on the same program. Oh, there it is. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. 
So um, I'm really happy to talk to you folks today and because I'm very interested in issues of inequality. And as you probably know, we have a lot of faculty members at Sanford uh, with Jay Pearson and Sandy Darity at the head of that pack uh, who care very deeply about these issues. And so I'm going to talk about food policy and hopefully make the case that when one is thinking about inequality and improving the situation with disparities, that food policy becomes a very important part of the picture, not only in the United States, but around the world. Um, a very interesting paper got published on Friday, um, and I hurried up and made some slides from this. It was a paper published in Lancet that talks about the global burden of disease. And it talks about what diseases are killing people around the world and what risk factors are leading to those diseases. And um, the slide, one slide I took from, actually it was an NPR report on this, talked about the top 10 risk factors for global deaths around the world. And you can see what the list is here. Um, blood pressure, smoking, obesity at the top of the list, but you can see what the others are as well. Now it's interesting, of the top 10 risk factors, uh, food are involved in seven of them. Um, most of them are pretty clear. Diet contributes to hypertension. Diet is obviously a prime driver of obesity. Um, Undernutrition becomes a real issue in, in some individuals. And I was just talking with one of my colleagues this afternoon, uh, Sabrendu Patnayak, who does work on indoor air pollution. And he's very interested in the uh, use of cook stoves around the world, especially in developing countries where people are burning wood inside confined areas with cook stoves to cook their food. So he said nearly 100% of the indoor air pollution risk factor comes from that, comes from the way people are cooking food. So it's a very interesting mix of risk factors. If you take the most populated, five most populated countries in the world, here they are, Let's look at what the leading risk factors are for those five countries, and they look like this. All things that are heavily affected by lifestyle and by food-related things in particular. And if you look at these risk factors, let's look around at, at all the countries in the world, counting all the countries in the world. Let's look at the percent of countries for whom blood pressure is the top risk factor body mass index, and then the other things you see there. And the numbers look like this. And when you sum them, they add to 83%. So 83% of the countries in the world have one of these four things as the leading risk factor for death. So diet and food-related things are, of course, heavily involved in this and have to be considered in the, in the world picture of health. Uh, and the day has long since passed where infectious diseases were the primary, are the primary concern, health concern in countries around the world. Uh, and now it's chronic diseases caused by matters of lifestyle. The health minister of China said several years ago that obesity is now a more significant problem in China than undernutrition and hunger. And there are those of us old enough to, you know, think that would have, that day would have never, ever arrived. And here we are. So if we look at world food issues, uh, for the sake of argument, we are clumping them into four categories. And when you put them all together, they form what is world food policy. But world food policy means things that are happening one block from here and in the region and the state and then all the way up to the world. And those four categories, as I said, converge on policy. So when we think of food and inequality issue, our minds automatically jump to food insecurity, which of course is a big issue, uh, but it's not the only one. Um, you could probably guess from the other slides that obesity is a primary large category of world food policy issues. The impact of agriculture on the environment and the reverse is a very important part of the overall food picture. And then food safety and security is the fourth category that we think about. So you could clump world food problems into lots of different groups, and there could be more or less than four. But just for the sake of argument, let's think about these four. <coughs> and when you put them all together, you have what the policy picture is. And if policies are working, a lot of people in the world can be helped. If they're not working, then a lot of people are harmed. So 
Just think about the United States with food assistance programs like SNAP and WIC, for example, that affect, affect vast numbers of people. If those policies are set up in a wise, reasonable way, people benefit. If they're not, they don't. So it's important that we get food policy right. Let's talk about hunger as the first of those categories. Uh, there are close to a billion people worldwide who are chronically undernourished, not episodically, but chronically undernourished, with very grave consequences for their physical, emotional development, ability to learn in school, ability to work, and things like that. Um, that number has improved to some extent over the past 30 and 40 years, but it's still extremely high and of course exists everywhere, even in countries like the United States where there's plenty of food. Um, how much longer can we feed the world? Well, that becomes a real question. Uh, these numbers are really quite striking, and nobody that I've seen talking about agriculture estimates have any sense that we can um, meet the food needs of the world if the world population is going to double in 50 years. Um, can we GMO our way to this problem, out of this problem? Can we um, do other things to help agriculture advances, help address this? We really don't know, but it's a very serious problem. And of course, if food becomes scarce, we know who suffers the most. Um, but we have a very local problem with this. Um, if you look at the top two things, uh, you see that in both North and South Carolina, approximately 25% of our children are living in conditions of food insecurity. And again, with pretty devastating consequences depending on the severity of the problem. So this is something very real to worry about. And um, this problem gets manifested in lots of different ways. Let's talk about obesity for a moment. Um, obesity, uh, as you know, is a raging problem in the United States, but elsewhere in the world as well. So this graph, behind those orange boxes, you're going to see the expected increases in diabetes up to year 2030 in the U.S. and India and China. In the U.S., we're expecting a 37% increase, which is a lot given how high our rates of diabetes are already. But in China, the numbers will look like that. In India, the numbers will look like that. And given the size of those, now we're starting with a lower denominator to be sure, but still, given the vast sizes of the population, so this is a huge, huge burden on the world's healthcare system. And almost all of this is pushed by obesity. It's type two rather than type one diabetes. Uh, there are lots of things that are driving obesity. Economic factors, changes in family structure, uh, changes in the, the workforce, um, uh, the proportion of people in the workforce, and a lot of different things are affecting this. Uh, agriculture policies are affecting it, but also one of the things that are affecting, one of the set of things are changes in food norms. And the, uh, uh, there have been these very systematic changes, mainly, well, at least in part, driven by a very explicit strategies of the food industry that encourage people to eat more. So, you know, when I was young, for example, nobody ate in their automobile. Nobody did that. Maybe if you were on a long trip, your family would pack sandwiches. But if you're an automaker now and those cup holders aren't big enough for the large size cups, you lose market share. Um, when we eat has been systematically changed. Um, and there are just different examples of this. So these food norms have been manipulated in a way where what we used to think was a large size of something is now called a small. And so it's just it, everything is really perverted in, in a terrible way. And these things, as I said, systematically lead to overeating. So I'll give you a few examples of this. I mean, you can just look at the drinks at a 7-Eleven. Now, when I was a kid, uh, Coke or Pepsi came in an 8-ounce bottle. And before that, it was 6.5 ounce. And now the smallest thing you can get at a 7-Eleven is double that size. And that seems small, of course, compared to all the larger ones. And if you consume the double gulp on the right, and it's filled with the sugar beverages. Sugar beverages is how much sugar you'll be consuming. And people routinely do these sort of things. So we, uh, what we've been recalibrated to a different sense of serving size. Uh, some of you may have seen this. Uh, the younger folks in the room are square in the crosshairs of the industry with this campaign. And the whole idea is that you should eat a meal between dinner and breakfast. And not only should you do that, but it should be fast food. 
Now, this is a very deliberate effort to get people to believe they should eat at a time of day when they ordinarily would not be eating it, and they'd be eating fast food during that time. Now, it was probably 20 years, maybe even more than that ago, 25 maybe, one of the fast food companies, Bob, you may remember this, introduced breakfast. I don't know if it's Burger King or McDonald's. People thought they were out of their minds. People thought that they would be boycotted by Americans who were incensed with the very idea that you could have fast food for breakfast. And look where we are now, completely recalibrated. So these are just examples. Here's another example of an item from Pizza Hut. And guess what's baked into that crust that surrounds the pizza? Cheese is old school. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. What about a hot dog? Now, could you think of a better, <laughs> a better delivery vehicle for fat and salt than this sort of thing? But again, these are very concerted efforts to change what people think. Um, so, what about North and South Carolina? Let's just look at the diseases that follow from obesity. <coughs> and let's look at adult and child obesity first. Here are the percentages. Now, this is the number of people who are obese, not just overweight. Those numbers would be in the 60s and 70% range. Um, and if you look at our rank, here's where we are in North Carolina. We're kind of in the middle of the pack in terms of uh, the percentage of adults who are obese. Uh, but South Carolina um, has much higher levels in terms of ranking. But look at child obesity. You know, we have the seventh highest rate in North Carolina, and South Carolina ranks number two. Hypertension and diabetes that follow from the obesity. Here's, here are the rankings for North and South Carolina, and here are the rankings for diabetes. <coughs> so there's a lot to worry about locally as well as globally with these issues. So... If you think about who's most affected by food insecurity and obesity, who is it? You know, it's people who are the poorest, people in certain demographic groups, um, and it's it's counterintuitive in in one hand, on one hand, that you'd have undernutrition and overnutrition both affecting the same population. But of course, it makes all the sense in the world that when people don't have enough resources or access to healthy foods. Um, then they're likely to be undernourished in one way and overnourished in another because they're driven to the cheapest foods, which are the highest processed, highly calorie dense, and least nutrient dense foods. So these two things go together in very interesting ways. And this is what some people call the dual burden. And this is, it got noted first outside of the U.S. in developing countries, but it certainly is an issue here where people who are undernourished early in life are at risk for obesity and diabetes later in life, probably because of some profound metabolic imprinting that goes on inside the body when you're undernourished at critical developmental stages, meaning that later you eat all you possibly can, you store the food, especially in your body fat, very effectively, and normal satiety mechanisms don't kick in because you think you're living in conditions of starvation. And in terms of healthy nutrients, you are living in conditions of starvation, but all those unhealthy nutrients are available at low cost. So these two issues of hunger and obesity play off each other in very interesting ways. Um, there are very interesting data on gaps that get created uh, by these risk factors in longevity. So these are data that came out um, probably about a month ago funded by a project of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that shows lifespan, average lifespan, depending on zip code. And this is the Raleigh-Durham area. So you can see the numbers depending on where you are uh, in this map. Now, it's not heavily blown up. So let me just draw your, oh, I'm sorry, let me draw your attention to two numbers here. This area on the top, the 88-year average lifespan, is an area just north and east of the airport a well-to-do area. And not very far away in, in East Raleigh down there, you see that average lifespan is 76 years. So by short, separated by a very short distance, that's a very significant difference in lifespan. And it's not just true in this area, but 
we can look at uh, two neighborhoods of a city. Anybody can guess what the city is? Atlanta. Yeah, Atlanta. Uh, and a seven mile difference makes a 13 year difference in life expectancy um, in these two particular neighborhoods. Now there are lots of things other than diet that are driving this because poverty drives almost every negative thing you can think of with regard to health. But diet and body weight regulation are certainly part of this picture. And so there's a lot of reason to think about food and nutrition in the context of inequality and disparities. Now, it's also true that agriculture and the environment are interacting in very interesting ways that also connect with issues of inequality. <coughs> <clears throat> there are a lot of reasons to worry about the modern state of agriculture, um, especially in countries like the United States where there's a lot of industrial farming, that is, a lot of animals in confined spaces, uh, monoculture, uh, the use of vast areas of land to grow one crop, um, have created all sorts of interesting challenges that we face. And I wish I had time to talk about all of them, but I'll just talk about these two as an example. So water becomes a very interesting issue in the context of agriculture. Um, the UN estimates that, well, you see the numbers here. These are very alarming numbers, and 2030 is not very far off. And what happens when people don't have enough water? Well, they can't grow enough food, political instability becomes a real issue, and lots of things that one might worry about. What's water being used for? Almost all of it for agriculture. And depending on what's being created from the agriculture, you have a more or less efficient use of water. So as an example of this, this slide is going to show how many gallons of water it takes to produce one kilogram of four different foods. And a kilogram is 2.2 pounds. So if you're gr growing corn, takes 172 gallons of water to create 2.2 pounds of corn. Okay. If you move to snap peas, uh, all of a sudden your orders of magnitude higher. If you're creating pork, the numbers are much higher, and you can probably guess what the worst number of all is, and it's for beef. So if corn is created and we're eating the corn, then the water calculus isn't so bad. But if that corn's being fed to the animals and then we consume the animals, the water calculus gets a lot, a lot worse. So why should we be worried about meat consumption? Well, one of the reasons is that the numbers are going way up. You know, they're continuing to increase a little bit in the United States from very high levels to begin with. But you can see what the numbers are like in China. So in China and India, where you have developing economies, large middle, large middle classes, are, are occurring in those larger middle classes and those countries are occurring. Middle class people want middle class things and including food and that means meat. So this is a real concern about water but there is another concern with meat consumption that I'll show you in a minute. Um, the US State Department is very concerned about political instability between countries based on diminishing water resources. And how long can it be when before a downriver country doesn't have a river any longer because the upriver country is exploiting all of it for agriculture? Perhaps efficiently, perhaps not. And you're starting to see things like this. All the political strife in Syria uh, is being caused at least in part by drought, which is being driven in part by global warming, and I'll come to that right now. We'll talk about climate change. Now, why do I show a big animal farm here and climate change? So this is a fat, what's known as a factory farm, confined animal feeding operations, CAFOs, uh, in California. And I think this particular place has 100,000 head of cattle. All sorts of environmental things come from this. And of course, there's the welfare of the animals to worry about. But let's just talk about climate change. This very interesting report came out from the Food and Agriculture Organization, which is part of the UN, talking about the impact of animal agriculture on climate change. Okay. Why does that occur? Well, first of all, there are lots of petroleum-based inputs to create animals that we eat. So th th those animals in the feedlot are probably in their third venue uh, during their lifespan. 
and there's transport, shipping animals long distances from where they're born to the, the middle feeding lot to the finishing lot, which is what you saw there. There are petroleum-based herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers used in the grain that feeds the animals. Petroleum is needed to pump the water out of the ground. So all of these things then create uh, climate change because of carbon dioxide. But even the greater concern are the gases that get emitted from the cows themselves from the digestive process. And there are two major ones, nitrous oxide and methane, that come from the cows. And these are especially bad actors in, in terms of climate change because they have a very long half-life when they get into the atmosphere. And so this report estimated that total greenhouse gas commission, uh, emissions from animal agriculture exceed those of all forms of transportation added together. All cars and trucks and buses are having less impact on climate change than animal agriculture. So climate is affected by agriculture, uh, and then the reverse occurs. So here's a, a data from, again, from the United Nations showing where wheat grows in the United States now and where it's, where it's expected to grow in 2050. So those, the orange crosshatch bars in the bottom show that now wheat grows in Texas all the way up into that narrow band in southern Canada. But by 2050, because of climate change, the only wheat expected to grow in the United States will be in that little band in northern Minnesota and North Dakota. That is a profound change in a relatively short period of time. And nobody knows what this will do to migration of populations, political stability of countries, uh, the agribusiness world, and all these sort of things. So with agriculture affecting climate, and climate then in turn affecting agriculture, you have these systems that some people believe are beyond the point of control. And can we do anything about it? It becomes a really interesting issue. Yeah, Bob? Is that because of drought and heat? Right. It's going to be that hot and that dry that we can't grow wheat. Right. Not many years. Now, some, uh, some crops are more temperature sensitive than others. So it could be, for example, that the, the graph of corn would look different from this. But, you know, you have to take this kind of thing pretty seriously. And again, who are the people going to be most affected by these, these sort of things? Um, so we have this interesting reciprocal relationship. Food safety and food and food security are interesting issues as well. Um, you, you may have seen the headline yesterday that an executive of a, a peanut company got sentenced to 28 years in prison for knowingly distributing salmonella tainted peanut butter. And the, that was a very intentional thing where there's obvious deceit going on. But you can think of all the times now where there's salmonella, E. coli outbreaks and things where there's no, there's no intent to do it, it's just occurring, and these are harder to contain. So food safety becomes a really important issue as well. So food policy really affects all of these things, and I think is a very important part of disparities that people experience, and a very important part of the inequality picture. So when we look around at the world, we think of all of the, these four different problems, and if you look at the policy picture, sadly what you have is uncoordinated, disconnected food policy. And, you know, it's human nature to, for people to work in their own area and not think about the others, but as you might guess, each of these four areas has its own NGOs, its own experts, its own conferences, its own world agencies, and they don't connect with each other very much. And as a consequence, you get all kinds of distorted food policy. Um, <coughs> you know, example would be subsidies to corn farmers in the United States to turn corn into ethanol, which was thought to be an environmental win, but had really negative impacts on the price of corn around the world, and it affected greatly um, indigenous farmers in developing countries and things like that. So there's a real need to bring all this together under one umbrella so that you can have better food policy. And food policy now is like the old whack-a-mole game. Remember this? You know, you go whack-a-mole and then some another one pops up somewhere else and that's pretty much what world food policy is like. But it's not just world food policy, it's local and state food policy. And we're no different than any other place in the country. We suffer from all these problems and need to address them. 
So there are lots of examples of conflicts, <coughs> and I'll just give you one <coughs> that's, an, that's an extremely interesting debate that's going on now that pits the public health community against the hunger advocacy community. And it's the third bullet point there about whether people who are on the SNAP program should be permitted to use their benefits to buy soda. Now, the two arguments on this are that what sense in the world does it make for the government to be buying things that make people sick? It's obviously not good for the people who get sick, but then government has to pay for the diseases caused by the illnesses. So soda contributes to obesity and diabetes. The evidence on that is rock solid. And then people get ill, incur medical care costs, and government has to pay for those again. Um, and the government now buys $4 billion worth of soda every year through the SNAP program. So on one hand, you ask, how much sense does that make? Now, but on the other hand, the hunger community says, greatly opposes restricting any cutback in this, this particular um, benefit. Um, because they say that poor people are stigmatized already. You're going to be taking something away from them. It will be embarrassing to them, and no good will come of this. So it's a very interesting debate, and both positions can be quite nicely defended, I think. So if these two communities had been working together all along, there might have been some way to work this out better so that you'd have healthier SNAP benefits um, and people be encouraged to eat healthier foods with them, uh, but you wouldn't have stigma and discrimination as a consequence of it. So there are lots of interesting things to think about, and there are other examples here that I won't give because of time. Um, some people think that international development is the solution to these food problems, but it doesn't necessarily happen to be the case. Uh, there was a, public, a paper published again in the journal Lancet that looked at this, and it basically found that in, in some parts of the world, increasing development in these countries and prospering economies did not really help address the hunger problem at all in children. So the folks who were left behind appear to be still left behind, even when you have this international development. So instead of just focusing on economic growth and expecting the food part of it to fall into place, you have to deal specifically with the food part of it in order to make sensible policy. So who's watching the whole store? Who's looking at all these things together? Well, there's really not very many places around the world where that occurs, and none that I can see in an academic setting. So we have this dream of creating a World Food Policy Center that would have expertise in all these areas, convene people from around the world, deal with food policy issues in Durham, in North Carolina, in the region, and going up to the world. And we think that if we had the necessary expertise, we could have something very special here, a signature enterprise for Duke and a signature enterprise for our school in particular. But this is something that can become a very collaborative enterprise because there are a lot of people at Duke who think about food issues in one way or another. Lots of people in the med school are concerned about nutrition and health. Uh, we have an expert here at Duke who came from the World Bank who's an expert on fisheries, management of fisheries. Um, there are lots of people around who care about these issues, so we're pretty a pretty special place to do this kind of thing. And if we have internal and external, external expertise brought together, and we cover the four areas by having this sort of expertise available, and I think a lot of it's here at Duke already, but when we think about a good school of agriculture at NC State, a great school of public health at UNC, uh, people in the triangle working on these areas like at RTI, uh, there's a ton of expertise in this area. And then hopefully we would involve the various stakeholders and be able to do in a science-based way better food policy. So that's really the dream that we have. So I'll, I'll end by saying that if any of you are particularly interested in this, let me know. Um, but I would love to connect with the work that's going on in the university on inequality because the, is, I mean, as I tried to, to make very clear, at least in my mind, I think disparity issues are driven a lot by food-related factors. Um, I don't know what percentage, but it's certainly there. And if you think about who's most vulnerable to undernutrition, to overnutrition and obesity, the impact of the negative consequences of agriculture, I mean, who lives near the farms 
you know, who's being affected by the, 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 the antibiotic runoff from the raising of the farm animals and stuff. And then the food safety and security issues, it's the most vulnerable people in the population. So my hope is that we can take advantage of all the different things going on around the university, work together, and I think we could do some pretty amazing things that way. So that's the end of the presentation, and again, I'm delighted to be here. And I don't know if you want to do questions now or move on to the next talk first or, or what, but... Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, you're right. Now, now they've readjusted the blood pressure norms to be lower than what they were originally to, to be considered as being a normal blood pressure. Um, so a lot more people now will be hypertensive uh, just because the standards have changed, and that argues for more aggressive treatment. But you know, our typical reaction in the United States to a problem like this is to treat it, treat it, treat it. Well, with blood pressure, thankfully, we can do that fairly effectively. But of course, these are things you'd love to prevent in the first place. And that means less salt in the diet, it means a better diet overall, more physical activity and all those kind of things. So it's a great example of you know, where you place your money now that you know that, now that you have this data. Do you want to just spend all your money on treating it or do you want to work on preventing it? And if you work on the preventing it, then food becomes a pretty important part of the picture. And by the way, you guys probably know that there are, um, depending on the particular risk factor or disease you're talking about, there can be big differences in racial um, vulnerability to those problems. Um, you know, with blood pressure, and then maybe Dr. Barry can talk about cancers. Um, but you know, you think about diabetes vulnerability, and there are certain uh, ethnic groups that are especially sensitive to risk factor increases at a pretty low level of excess weight. So there are all these interesting race and and, and other issues built into this. I have a question. Um, first of all, excellent presentation. It was really, it was really well done and, and really opened my eyes to a lot of other factors that plays into um, the food industry and the impact it has on health outcomes. I'm kind of curious. So, have you been able to, or any of your co collaborators, been able to engage with the Mayor's Initiative um, in terms of poverty, uh, poverty, as well as some of the other food desert initiatives that's been happening in the area? Yeah. Um, and if so, in what way? Yeah, we're, we're just now getting connected. Um, we've had some meetings with the, the city and county managers um, and with several others involved in that and with some members of the city council and to a, a smaller extent the mayor. So I think you know, Durham becomes a really interesting place to live when you're concerned with these issues because you know, just like any other city, we have these issues. But as you can see, we have them in a more pronounced way. That's why the rankings for North Carolina don't look so great. So there's a lot of opportunity to use Durham as a, not only as a test site to see what kind of policies work the best, um, but to make a real difference in our own community. So I think there's a, a great up, great opportunity there. <coughs> yeah, it's definitely on the radar locally. So it, it, this is a good time to be able to start galvanizing, galvanizing and bringing together those nine partners. So exciting. Thank yeah, you. I agree with that. And then another thing that that is argues in the in favor of doing this is that North Carolina is a, a pretty important agriculture state. So there are lots of opportunities to connect with that part of the picture as well. You know, we're the second largest hog growing, hog producing state in the country. Um, so we're, we're a very important player in that respect. Okay. What kind yes? of role does uh, health education play in trying to change all this? You know, if we look at the issues like cancer, Smoking and sun exposure and things like that. But you know, public health campaigns are responsible for you know most of the decreases in smoking and all the associated benefits yeah. that go along with it. Long you have a lower cost. You know, I mean, we're up against the tobacco industry was as powerful a lobbying group as there is in the country. Uh, and centralized to an extent that the food industry is. That's correct. 
And I just wonder whether there's a, you know, how optimistic you are that that health education can play a, a, a critical role in. Yeah. Well, it's a really good question, Bob, and and I think one with a with a complicated answer. I think when you when you're fighting a problem where you don't have an industry to fight against, like say sun exposure, then I think health education can be good. Um, when it comes to a, a tobacco or food or alcohol or things like that, it's very hard to counter the information that the industry is producing. And then I think you've got to go right to policies. And so the health economists have worked out the various contributions of different things to the decline in smoking in the US. And by far the most powerful were the high taxes on cigarettes. The, the knowledge was part of it, and that came along, but the high taxes were the most powerful thing. And I'll give you an example of this. Uh, right now, the largest funder in the world of work on childhood obesity is the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and they're spending $100 million on it every year. So that's an absolute godsend for those of us who care about that issue. But guess which day of the year the food industry has already spent $100 million adver just advertising junk food to kids? January. January 4th. Wow. So health education, you know, you could think of the billions of dollars it would take to counteract what the food industry is doing. So to me, that money is much better spent with policies that would affect lots of people. But in some cases, education works great, like seatbelts were a good example of that. Yes? Um, just really quick, I want to speak up about the recent comment on the Medicare for All bill that was introduced. We've actually had, um, we've had a relationship with them since it started Uh -huh. Like sliding scale uh, produce delivery uh, scheme. So actually, like all like local farms um, between like Raleigh, Pittsburgh, Chapel Hill are donating all of their ugly produce, mm -hmm. and it'll be sliding scale. So higher income customers will subsidize the cost. It will be entirely free for people who receive EBT mm -hmm. benefits and zero. So there are like you know that's not a policy, but that's just one little small. Yeah, you know that's it's a it's a terrific example of local ingenuity. So I'm happy happy to hear more about that. And so where does policy come into the picture? Because that's really a program that's undertaken by you know because you have a mayor who cares a lot about these things and others in the city government. So the question is, how do you take a local victory like that and make it occur in every city in the state? Then it becomes a matter of policy. Or can government come up with money to help subsidize programs like that? Then it becomes policy. So the ultimate solution to more than sporadic local victories is policy, I think. Yes, sir. You know, that, that issue about liking it becomes very important here. And I um, edited a book a couple of years ago with a colleague of mine on the issue of food and addiction and what foods do to the brain. And sugar in particular works on exactly the same reward pathways that nicotine does and alcohol and cocaine and, and heroin. Um, so there, there are really interesting legal issues bound up in that. But I think you're exactly right. You're having to fight massive marketing, but also this reward system in the brain that makes us want those kind of things that in an evolutionary way would have paid off at an earlier time in human history, but now don't. <coughs> so I think you have to do a lot of different things. Um, so let's just take soda, for example. Uh, it's the major contributor. It's it's number one contributor to added sugar in the American diet. Uh, very clear relationships with bad health outcomes. So what's being done about it? Well, my colleagues and I over the years have worked on getting sodas out of schools. 
potentially restricting the marketing of them to kids. And the thing that we've worked on the most is a soda tax. So, you know, we've been talking about a soda tax for 25 years now or so. Uh, the first time I wrote about this was an op-ed in the New York Times and just got slaughtered with the very idea of taxing soda. But now there are taxes on soda in five different countries, including France and Mexico. Uh, Berkeley just passed the first large soda tax in the United States and large, lots of other places are considering it. So I think a combination of education and these structural changes, like not having them around in schools and increasing the price can ultimately make a difference. Yeah, but I mean, you see, yeah. But I guess you see, it's just, it's Well, in fact, public opinion polls weren't what you think they were on that. It was this massive campaign by the industry to discredit the idea that gave the impression that people weren't in favor of it. And it, it got rejected by a, the, the highest court in the state of New York on a legal quirk. Um, but I've written a, a paper with a legal colleague of mine, uh, and basically we, we made the point, we think, that, these, that the, the restriction of serving sizes with things like soda is a completely doable thing for different jurisdictions around the country. So I'd be surprised if five or 10 years from now, we don't see those things pretty routinely.